In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most kind. Whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth is Allah. And whether you mistaken and whether you manifest what is in your mind or hide it, Allah will call you to account according to it. Then he will forgive whom he pleases and chastise whom he pleases. And Allah has had power over all things. The Prophet believes in what has been revealed to him from his Lord, and so do the believers. They all believe in Allah and his angels and his books and his prophets. We make no difference between any of his apostles, and they say, we hear and obey. Our Lord, your forgiveness do we crave, and to you is the eventual course. Allah does not impose upon any soul a duty but to the extent of its ability. What is the benefit of what it has earned and upon it the evil of what it has wrought? Our Lord, do not punish us if we forget or make a mistake. Our Lord, do not lay on us a burden as thou didst lay on those before us. Our Lord, do not impose upon us that which we have not the strength to bear and pardon us and grant us protection and have mercy on us. Thou art our, our patron, so help us against the unbelieving people. Thank you very much, John. My dear brothers and sisters, all praise is indeed you to Allah who created us, who allowed us all the intellect and all the faculties that we have, who gave us our vocal cords with which to sing with and our ears with which to hear with. All blessings are due to him. May his peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome to the second uh, intensive seminar. Um, this is we were having one a month. So last month we dealt with the issue of homosexuality, and today we're looking at the issue of music and singing, um, presented by uh, Dr. Munir. I just want to just give a short introduction to Dr. Munir. Um, I've known him for, and this is the 30th, our 30th anniversary together. <laughs> um, and I, I first met him in a little uh, camp uh, going back in 1988. Um, and I've never looked back, certainly. I know Samara is very jealous of our relationship. Uh, but um, I have to say that I. I went to Newcastle University, I went to study medicine, and I always prided myself in my ability to learn my skills as a student. So I had a little bit of an arrogance maybe there, well, not maybe. 
Um, but all that was um, put to bed when I met Dr. Munir. And for the last, uh, in 1996, um, he introduced me to Sheikh Abdullah Judeh, uh, who was at that time, still is, but was uh, heavily involved with the Leeds Grand Mosque. And Sheikh Abdullah Judeh is a, a world leading muhaddith, hadith scholar. And we started, the two of us, to go on a weekly basis to study Usul al Fiqh first, the, the science of jurisprudence in Islam. And we've been there since, in fact, we there only this week. Um, and it's now we celebrate the 21 years of, of, of going there. And I have to say, I, I'm really a spectator there. I, I gain little bits here and there. Alhamdulillah, Munir's student, stu, uh, his ability as a student, Alhamdulillah, very, very, very strong, very good. Um, so he's mastered his his, his um, specialities, his self discipline, and I probably hate to be saying all this, but he himself has taught himself probably I would say a third to half the Quran by heart. Has learned Arabic by himself. So that when we sit there, I'm there with my scribbling away in English, he's scribbling away in Arabic, and all self-taught. And every session we go to, he'll have read the uh, Mughni and uh, Ibn Qudamas and uh, all the different uh, Madahi positions on the particular subject we're looking at. So I can be absolutely assured that today you're going to get a full um, in-depth analysis of this subject. I can say hand on my heart having been involved with the Islamic scene, so-called Islamic scene in the last 30 years, that you will not get a better rendition of this subject anywhere in the UK, neither has there been. So you'll get a, a, a total analysis of the different issues. And the benefit here is most Fukaha, uh, they, they'll be able to give you a position on a particular matter, but what they can't do, generally speaking, is tell you the analysis of the hadiths involved. And there we're blessed to have the, uh, the, uh, our sessions with Sheikh Abdullah Judeh where he can tell us the different strengths of the hadith. So with that, um, I shall now move to the back over there with my guitar eventually, and I'll hand over to the main. Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu, Nasta'inuhu, Nasta'hdi, Wana'udhu Billahi Min Shuri Anfusina, Wa Min Sayyati A'malina, Man Yahdillahu Fahuwa Al-Muhtad, Wa Man Yudlil, Falan Tadira Lahu Waliya Murshida, Wa Ashadu An La Ilaha Inna Allahu Wahdahu La Sharika Lah, Wa Ashadu Anna Sayyidina Wa Mawlana Wa Habibana Wa Uswatana Muhammad Rasulullah, صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحابته ومن تبعه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد أيها الأخوة نحييكم بتحية الإسلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Praise be to Allah He alone is worthy of all praise As we praise Him we seek His forgiveness, guidance and His mercy We seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our bad deeds and we seek His refuge from the evil and bad inside us. Know that one who is guided by Allah, they are truly guided. One who is left to go astray will not find a guide or a protector or a helper after that. And I bear witness that there is no God but the one true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is between them. And I bear witness that Muhammad, peace and prayers of Allah be upon him, is his slave and messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, اعلموا انما الحياه الدنيا لعب وله وزينه وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر وتكاثر في الاموال والاولاد كمثل غيث اعجب الكفار نباته ثم يهيج ثم تراه مصفرا 
ثم يكون خطاما وفي الآخرة عذاب شديد ومغفرة من الله ورضوان وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور In Surah Al-Hadid, Allah SWT says Know then all of you that the life of this world is play and amusement and beautification and boasting in competing with one another and in competing in lots of wealth and children and families it is like a similitude of when Allah sends the rain and how the farmer, the grower of the crops, marvels at what the rain produces of vegetation. Then it becomes dry. Then you see it go yellow. Then you see it become stubble. So this is the life of the dunya, the similitude. As Allah SWT mentions the beauty in it and all its play and amusement. Allah SWT is saying what will happen to it in the end. So don't attach yourself with it. And the reality Allah SWT jumps straight away. Whereas in the hereafter. In other words, the way Allah SWT brings it in the ayah is that it's imminent. That it is imminent. And in the hereafter, there are just two choices. Arabu shadeed, severe punishment, or ma'fratun min Allahi wa ridwan, a forgiveness of Allah and the pleasure. That is his pleasure and your pleasure and his forgiveness and in his pleasure. Wa mal hayatu dunya illa mata'ul gurur. And surely there the life of this world is only enjoyment, enjoyment and amusement of deception. This ayah can sometimes give the appearance as though Allah SWT is shunning everything to do with dunya. If that was the case, then this deen would come with teaching us to become monks and leave the dunya. It mentions in this ayah, as it mentions amusement, it mentions things that, that we all like. Of beautification, it's beautification. And wealth and children. And wealth and children. But it mentions in a way so we don't become totally attached. What it's giving is ifar to the akhirah and reminding us that this is temporary. That this is temporary. A bit like also the ayah Allah SWT says, Zuyina lil nasi hubu shahwati minan nisa wal banina wal qanati al mukantari minal dhahdi wal fiddha. But Allah SWT is saying, we have made it beautiful in the eyes of human beings. What? Love for desire. Here it says, Shahwat minan nisa. Desire from women. This means sexual desire, actually, Shahwat. So it applies the other way around as well. For women, their sexual desire for men. Allah saying He's put that as a natural thing in human beings. Yeah? And to, have, to love to have children. And to have mountains full of gold and for silver. Well, fiddha. Well, khaylul musawwama. And to have steeds and horses which, uh, which are brandy. Well, an arm and cattle. Well, hearth. And to have crops and vegetation. Zalika mata'ul hayat dunya. Zalika mata'ul hayat. This is the enjoyment of the life of this world. Wallahu indahu husnul ma'ab. Husnul ma'ab. Husnul ma'ab. And with Allah is the most beautiful abode. This is for this world, but these are things that Allah SWT has put there for human beings. So Allah SWT is saying that Allah put that beautification and the love for these things in dunya in the human beings by their very nature. But Allah is reminding us not to get attached to them. 
that the reality is you're coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's where the refinal abode is. So don't get attached to these, to these things and though you're going to be there permanently. So to avoid giving us the attitude of shunning the world and leaving it and becoming monks, and we know that this monkism is not from Islam, كما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ اللَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعِبَادِهِ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّسْكِ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّسْكِ Say, who has forbidden the beautification of Allah which he has brought forth أخرج العباد for his slaves and of goodness وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّسْكِ of goodness in sustenance and risk in food and sustenance, wider than that. قُلْ هِيَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا خَالِسَةً يَوْمَ الْقَيَامَةِ Say, they, these things are for the believers in the life of this world. Here Allah SWT doesn't say they are for human beings in the life of this world. And actually they are, aren't they? All these things, the goods, the beautification, and uh, good sustenance they're for all human beings. But here Allah SWT is stressing why amanu say they are for the believers. So the believers don't get a concept, an idea that they're not for us. We have to shun them. So Allah is stressing for the believers, they are for you. But but only for the believers on the day of resurrection. So this ayah again is saying, who's made these things forbidden? Well, Allah SWT gives them of the bounty and the good things and the things that we like to enjoy. Yeah, that are all part of our nature and bounty that Allah SWT has given us. Except that which is forbidden. And he clarifies what is forbidden. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran clearly and through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there is بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبَقَى Nay, you prefer the life of this world where as a life to come, the akhirah, hereafter, is better and everlasting. This ithar is being developed in the believers to make them give priority for the judgment that's about to come. The judgment's about to come. So in order to balance it, we have to balance with all the chronic ayah to give the balance in our understanding that yes, Allah SWT has given us of his gift and his bounties. And therefore you have uh, not just Sahaba, you have messengers like Dawood and Sulaiman alayhim as -salam, who were kings in this world, were they not? And no, ever, no human ever existed who were richer than Sulaiman alayhi salam. Is that not so? Owning so much of riches and power, messengers of Allah. So included in that beautification and palaces where, where the Queen of Sheba is walking as though she's walking on water, on glass in the palaces. That's the kind of luxury and, and beauty that, uh, uh, of legend of the palaces of Sulaiman alayhi salam. And those things are not being mentioned negatively, they're mentioned positively. But for the believer is the attitude to the gift and bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the attitude is being mentioned here. And I mentioned that as part of an introduction. I'll finish with a hadith which is reported in Sahih Muslim. And it is a famous hadith of Pandala uh, al Usayyidi. Pandala al Sayyidi, or he's known as Pandala ibn Rabi al Taymi as well. A companion of Rasulullah Sallam, who was one of the uh, one of the secretaries, one of the scribes of Rasulullah Sallallahu He says, Lakitani Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr met me one day and one report he's saying and he found me crying, upset. Radiallahu anhuma. anta ya handala. How are you, Handala? You know what's the matter? Fault, he said, I said, Na Papa Handala. Handala has become a monafic. Handala is a hypocrite. And Abu Bakr said, Subhanallah, glory be to Allah. What are you saying? What are you saying? 
قلت he said نكون عند رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يذكرنا بالجنة والنار كأن رأي عين فإذا خرجنا من عفسنا الأزواج والأولاد والضيعات نسينا كثيرا he said why do you think, why am I saying my hypocrite? He said, when we were the messenger of Allah. Yeah. He reminds us of paradise and hell. And the reminder is so strong, it's as though we see it. We see it clearly. Then we leave and we come back amongst our families and our children and we get busy and we forget so much. So we're not in the same state as we were then. You know, we're busy with life and dunya and earning and looking after and part of that in family is enjoyment. So, Abu Bakr said, that's my situation as well, actually. That's my situation. So let's go and see the message of Allah. He'll clarify for us. So they come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the same thing is repeated. Alhamdulillah saying uh, that but I'm like a hypocrite. So when he explains to the Messenger of Allah, what did the Prophet say? He said, Walladi nafsi biyiri. Law tudumuna ala ma takununa indi. Wa fi zikr. He's saying, but by him in whose hands is my soul, by Allah. If you were to continue in the state that you were in when you are with me, with the reminder that I'm giving, he said, surely the angels will come and shake your hands in your bedrooms and in your sitting rooms and on your roads and streets. In other words, when the angels arrive to shake your hands and you see them coming, it's impossible. The angel arrives, it's already death. You're in a different world. Why the Prophet is saying that? It's not going to happen. In other words, you can't be in that state all the time. It's impossible. That's why then the Prophet says something famous. Ya handala sa'a wa sa'a. Sa'a wa sa'a. Sa'a wa sa'a. As if to stress or actually he said it three times. Or oh, handala. There's a time for this and a time for that. A time for this, a time for that. A time for this and a time for that. So this is a beautiful hadith about bringing the balance of this deen. Yeah. I mention that because on the one hand, there are those who are busy with just leisure and pleasure and ha ha, he he and the glitter of the world. That is very dangerous for us, no doubt. Right? And especially with the title that we're looking at, we're talking about music and singing in regards to Islam. But on the other hand, there are those who will lead us to believe, and that's the other side I see as extreme, is that believers, when they shun that, those who say this, that the believers should be busy only filling their time with reading Quran and Hadith all day long. As though our hearts and minds mustn't have any room for anything else, only Quran and Hadith. That is contrary to what this Hadith is saying. That is contrary to how Rasulullah, how the Sahaba lived their lives, is it not, brothers and sisters? You just have to read a little bit of Sira, a little bit of life of Rasulullah and look at a multitude of hadith and you'll see that kind of idea, concept is alien to Islam. Islam, this is deen, deen al-hadithiyya samha. Kama qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I'll tell you with context, he said it in later on, which is very pertinent. He said, I have been sent with the deen hadithiyya upright samha. You know what it means? Liberal. I heard so many people saying, oh, liberal view. Liberal this, liberal this. Anybody who says there's a bit of relaxation, oh, liberal. Because Islam is to be... And this is part of this following of the Christians and Jews, of following them into the, the hall of the desert lizard, of making religion so tight and narrow that everything becomes so religious, like, you know... As though we need to be like robots walking around, all looking the same, all dressing the same, all speaking with the same. You know, I remember in Dawah, there were some young people we had in the 80s. And when we used to talk about Dawah and how to find common ground with people, there were some young people who were so narrow-minded, 
and we give it to them, they were young. Right? There's no need to speak to people about anything in that one. The best thing is just read the Quran to them. What is better than the Quran? So given the impression that all you can go around doing is speaking Quran. Who did that from the prophets and the Anbiya and the Sahaba? Yeah, this narrow-minded idea. So on the other extreme, this idea that we, it is impossible. It is impossible. Therefore, Rasulullah pulled back Sahaba who had a tendency to go extreme even in Ibadah. Did he not? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he's saying, Inna Allah la yamal hatta kamal. Allah SWT will not grow weary of your ibadah, but you will grow weary. And that weariness is to do with becoming also, because shaitan plays on your weariness, weariness of day and night ibadah, day and night ibadah, day and night ibadah. And he pulled those away who wanted to fast all the time to stop them. Those who wanted to stay awake all night to stop them. To give right to their husband and wife. Yeah, which means in the relationship, of the marital relationship, isn't it? That's exactly what he's talking, he's talking about, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which is to do with the enjoyment of dunya. So, this balance is so important to understand at the outset. With the ithar to the hereafter always. Giving preference to the hereafter always. Um... And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu always, and I've given examples as well, uh, gave warning about doing tashaddud, going to extremes in the religion. Yeah. This deen is easy. And how the Prophet started calling it deen, and Allah calls it deen because it's a way of life. It's not just a few rigidified codes. A way of this deen has been made easy. And there isn't a person who goes strictly into this deen that it overtakes them. In other words, it destroys them. It destroys them. Strictness destroys them. So they take step by step, coming closer, little by little. Allah as Allah SWT says in the Quran. So be conscious and in awe of Allah as much as you're able to, little by little, step by step. And that is also fitting with the nature of human beings, insan. Those who falter, those who fall, those who sin, those who keep on sinning. Yeah, that's why the famous hadith from the Prophet وسلم, that Allah says, and all human beings, whether to become sinless, Allah will destroy them. That's you and me. So those going around claiming sinless, you know, living this, you know, living this bubble idea. Allah would destroy them and replace them with those who sin and do tawbah to him. Glory be to him. And that attitude will produce in us a humility. It will produce in us a, 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 an idea of real understanding of this deen and its balance and its yusr and its ease actually. Now, that's way of uh, introduction because even though um, Slide. It's, oh, well, no, no, I'll go right now. Yeah. Now, to begin with, we need some definitions to understand when we're going to analyze the Quran and the Hadith. And these are the kind of words that will come up. Firstly, 
singing, which is Rina. Rina in Arabic. And that Rina must be understood. That Rina means singing with using a voice in a melodious way. Therefore, it means melody by itself. Yeah, singing cannot be when you shout or just speak like normal. It wouldn't be called singing. And I mentioned that because there are fiqaha ulama. And you know, when I've gone through research, it's so astonishing how some of them saw singing as being allowed for some because it had no melody. And they put conditions on people's singing as long as they were not melodious. Well, that's a very, I guess, the very definition of singing. So you're allowed to sing as long as you don't have melody. What kind of nonsense is that? It's a contradiction in terms. So you see putting people putting conditions, yeah, and that's why I mentioned in the very definition of the word singing, and uh, ulama like Abu Hamid al-Ghazali and uh, Ibn Hazm and others, they use the idea of singing, the tune, coming applied to, for example, bird singing. Because they have, their singing has notes and melody. Yeah? And people who are uh, skilled musicians who are able to take the notes, the song of a bird, which we call a song, and make it into a tune for human beings to sing by that kind of tune. So singing by its very definition, essence, means using a melody. The and and you find singing, as we'll see in the evidences, there were all kinds of singing already present at the time of Rasulullah and before in Jahiliya, of course, as well. And actually, you'll find probably world over. But specific uh, time uh, types we'll see in the various hadith. The one which was also and and. Most, many of the time, it is poetry being put into word. In fact, that's the case with songs even up till this day. Poetry being sung. Poetry can be said, but it can be sung as well. So when it is sung, it changes from poetry to rina, to singing. Music, of course, the word musika, which is a, a modern term, wasn't used at the time of Rasulullah what is used at that time is a word, a word called Malahi or Al Ma'azif. Malahi, which means musical instruments, comes from the word Lahu. And that word is very important to understand and we'll come up to it, come to deal with it later. Remember this word Lahu. Lahu basically means a pastime. It can include amusement, relaxation, just means pastime. It can mean wasting time as well. Yeah. But it doesn't always mean wasting time. So, lahu is from that they took the word malahi, musical instruments, meaning for amusement. Al malahi. And ma'azif comes from the word uh, azaf. Azaf is used originally in the meaning of. Uh, uh, as for rih, for example, the the sound of the wind. Maybe when it's going through a narrow corridor, you see that you hear the wind. But they used it especially for the the voices of jinns because it was captivating. So ma'asif comes from that. Ma'asif are musical instruments, and it includes all musical instruments. By the way, al ma'asif includes all musical instruments and that's important to remember you cannot start taking some instruments out of it and say yeah if you're going to say all musical instruments are haram then you can't take some out and say well because they're ma'azif because some use the argument they say well we don't agree with wind instruments like the mizmar or the guitar or the string instrument because they're too melodious the drum, the duff, that's all right because it has no melody. Nonsense! The duff is ma'azif because it has melody. If somebody just goes bang, 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 bang like that, you're not going to say, well, that's, he's playing the drum. You say, he's an idiot, he doesn't know how to play the drum. True? 
So playing the duff, duff, which is, which was very common in those because it's easily available. But it wasn't the only instrument I will see at the time of Rasulullah. But it's common because it's easy to make. Yeah. Easily available. And therefore that's what's going to be used. Yeah. If it's going to be used. So duff is that which is, has, has one side and plays like a drum. Then you have something called uh, not and there, ke uh, 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 a kibber or uh, tabal as it came to known, which was a two-sided drum. A bit like they call it dolki in, in the uh, in the Asian continent. Yeah. So that kind of drum of two sided, as you see, also existed at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Mizmar, Mizmar is flute or mazamir, that is the wind instruments. So Mizmar is flutes. Buk is a, al buk is a, a more modern thing, is a trumpet, uh, and al oud or lute is a string instrument, yeah. and tambour as well which is a mandolin, a kind of string instrument. And oud is important because it's interesting that that will also come up uh, in uh, one of the hadith that narrations that come. Now, those are something uh, in regards to uh, definitions. That's an oud, tambour, which is a mandolin, tabal, which can also be, that might be showing one side, we can have two sides, which was the, uh, mizma. A few things that we need to understand before we do some analysis. We're all already well running out of time fast. First, when we consider any issue, the first principle is that Al Asluk fil Asha al Ibaha. This is in jurisprudence, Allah must say. That the principle is that everything in the world is allowed. Is allowed by its very, the very fact that Allah made it for it exists, because Allah Subhanahu wa says, "Wallahi khalaqa lakum fil ardi jamia." It is He who created for you everything in the earth for you. Wa sakhara lakum ma fil ardi jamia minhu. He has subdued everything that is in the earth for you, all of it, all of it. So everything Allah Subhanahu wa Taala made for us. So, by the very foundation, the first principle is that everything is allowed, meaning unless we have text, wahi, to make it haram. That's how revelation came. Revelation didn't come with lists of things you're allowed to do, did it? Quran comes with things which are haram for eating and drinking, for example. It didn't then give a long list of all the things which are halal, does it? It gives you what's haram, which means everything else is halal. So, al asl fil ashya al ibaha. Second thing, when you look at the issue of music or any issue, and in this case music and singing, you have to decide: is this an issue to do with ritual worship or to do with people's adat, everyday living and life? Quite clearly, this issue is not to do with ritual worship, is it? This is to do with culture and everyday life of people. So ulama then divide that as well in how they look at it. Because the rule in usul in jurisprudence for ibadat is different from that which is in adat. In ibadat, in usul, we derive from the Quran and Sunnah that al-aslu fil ibadat al-ta'abud, al-kaf. The, the principle in regards to ibadat is is ta'abud means worship that which we only worship according to revelation that come. We don't establish ibadat from ourselves. So ibadat is not something like the rest of life that's coming on from jahliya 
and Islam accepted it and adjusted it. No, ibadat only comes from wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are only allowed to do ibadah and pray in this way. You can't make it up as you go along. You can't use a principle, it's allowed unless Allah makes it haram here. No, not an ibadat. So ibadat only according to revelation. Adat has a different ruling. Al-aslu fil adat al-hil. Just like before the principle. In adat, in everyday living, the principle is halal. Unless something comes to make it harm. That's important to understand. And when you see that in regards to uh, uh, halal, we already got from the Quran, Allah SWT giving us his قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعْبَادِهِ وَطَيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ Shay who has forbidden the beauty from things that Allah has brought forward for his servants and from, from that, all that which is good in the way of sustenance. Yeah. And then amongst those things are things that we like. For example, when the Prophet said in authentic hadith, لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال رجرة من الكبر قال رجل يا رسول الله When the Prophet mentions that the one who, a person who has even an atom's degree of arrogance in their heart will not enter paradise. So a man says, Ya Rasulullah, what about uh, uh, one who likes to wear nice clothes and nice shoes? Is there any kibber in that? Is there any kibber in that? So the Prophet said, La, inna Allah jameel, yuhibbul jamal. No kibber in that. Al kibber, baturul haq, wa hamdun nas. So the Prophet explained now what kibber is. Okay. So the man, when the man said that, the Prophet said, No, Allah, surely Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. So in other words, you enjoying your nice clothes, which Allah has given you as a bounty, and your nice shoes, it's not part of kibber. Unless a kibber is. Uh, uh, batrul haq is to reject the truth. Reject the truth. Batrul haq. Meaning, you reject the truth because you think lowly of somebody. Even though they're telling the truth and speaking that which is right, but you reject it because you think, ah, I'm not listening to that. Too good. And ghamtun nas is hikar. Looking down on people. That is what kibr is. So if you're not wearing nice clothes, yeah, and if you're not wearing nice clothes, nice shoes, in order to look down upon people, you have no kibber in you. If you're wearing them for that purpose, then the kibber is not because of the clothes and the shoes, the disease is in the heart. You follow me? Now, the other thing, once our source, of course, is to find out whether something which is allowed as being made haram is the Quran first. If we find nothing in the Quran, we don't say we're finished with it. There's the ahadith. In ahadith, of course, the issue is not just the fact that it's hadith, but the first thing we have to check is an authentic hadith. That is in the, in the field of specialism. Just because you find it in the seha sitta, which in itself is a misnomer, by the way, because people think the six authentic books means all of them contain authentic hadith. This is a misnomer. This is not true. It is, a, it is a title that was given by others hundreds of years later. In fact, the compilers like Abu Dawood of his Sunan and Tirmidhi of his Al Jamia, his compendium, and they never claimed that we only put authentic hadith in this. Only Bukhari and Muslim claim that, that we've chosen the best and the most authentic for their Sahih Hain. So to put them all on that, it's very important. And of course, the book of, books of Ahadith are beyond that. You find Ahadith in Tafsir of At-Tabari, you find them in Ibn Abi Shayba, uh, Musannaf Ibn Abdi Razzar, Mu'atta Ibn Imam Malik, in Muslim Ibn uh, Muslim Ahmad, Ahmad Ibn Hanbal. So this, nevertheless, they are collections. And Tahqiq, 
Well, establishing that which is, is the first step before you start deliberating over the hadith and see what it means, isn't it? You can end up deliberating over a hadith and then you find afterwards it's actually fabricated. So you're wasting your time. In other words, Rasulullah didn't say it. And in regards to Quran, of course, absolutely, that's not the issue. Quran, the issue is the understanding of words. Because much of the Quran in ahkam and rulings comes and gives room for ta'wil, they call it, or tafsir. So, ulama and fuqaha, right from the time of the sahaba till this day, saw a different angle to the same word in the same verse and drew different conclusions. And their conclusions are not absolute for us. The only person's conclusion that's absolute for us is whose? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why Imam Malik famously said, and before him, Abdullah ibn Abbas from Jamal Quran also said the same thing. As standing in the mosque in Medina, near the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu Imam Malik famously said, we take and we leave from the opinions of everyone and anyone, except the occupier of this grave, sallallahu You understand that's a very important principle. This is the room for ishtihad, and ishtihad, ishtihad isn't the final say, because they're human beings. Yeah? They're human and therefore so many different opinions. And therefore, no scholar is free from making mistake. Never has been, from even Sahaba's time till this day. But no Sahaba is, oh, no, no, no scholar is also, who is qualified properly, to be thrown on the rubbish dump in everything that they say because you don't like a particular opinion of them that is unjust that is unjust following on from the principle that i've said now the other thing is that so you corroborate hadith and therefore to read to understand this Da'if hadith, weak hadith, and weak hadith is just a term, but I'll tell you there are so many categories under it, and many of the latter day scholars don't delve into this. They just say weak hadith, and they say, oh, well, it's not too bad. Well, it could be fabricated, and they can still use a title weak hadith. Completely fabricated. It could have five or six mistakes and problems with it. Still say it's a weak hadith. Da'if could mean it has one problem with it, but the fact and principle that we need to understand, a Da'if hadith, all ulama of any credibility are clear, cannot be the basis of a hukum and a ruling on its own. No way, because it's conjecture, because with weak hadith we cannot say for sure that Rasulullah said this. Very important principle to understand. Okay? Some said, some said um, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and he was an expert in hadith. Not only faqih, but muhaddis. Some saw him just as a muhaddis, actually, and a literalist. And they rejected him, especially in the Maghrib. They didn't uh, see him as a scholar, but he was a scholar as well as muhaddis. And, he, and uh, some said he took weak hadith. But if you look at Ahmad ibn Hanbal taking weak hadith, then the level of his weak hadith were later on described by Tirmidhi as Hassan Hadith, good Hadith. So some took liberality by that opinion, he took weak Hadith and thought we can take weak Hadith as well. Your week that you're taking is not the same as a week of Ahmad ibn Hanbal. There's no comparison. It is incorrect that interpretation to come to that conclusion. Second, Ahmad ibn Hanbal didn't take weak Hadith to make a new ruling from it. He took it in his tihad when he found nothing else. But not to build a new rule on it. This is not the way of jurisprudence, because it is seen as conjecture. Um, and there's much more I can say. Now, much of my uh, work and analysis is being based on the research of our teacher, Sheikh Abdullah Yusuf Ibn al Judai. Uh, and this is an amazing, amazing work, amazing research. I'm afraid it's only in Arabic, um, but it, it, it's as 
it's a scholarly research, it's for scholars. His books are for scholars, his research is done for other scholars to, to, to learn from. Uh, and, and together with also studying other things like Mughni and Nekodama's uh, Mughni his, and, and how he dealt with the issue and the various opinions, and, uh, his opinion according, and also how he presents the opinion of others, including, uh, of course, Ahmad in the Hanbal, and he's Hanbali, but he, used, he often comes out of the opinion of the Hanabila Madhav with his own opinions as well. And also uh, uh, <laughs> looking at famously uh, a paper done by the... Um, a famous scholar, a Shokani Yemeni scholar uh, from uh, over 200 years ago. Uh, and he wrote a, a book, about 66 pages in Arabic, uh, on Batlu Da'wa al Ijma. He wrote a paper saying, destroying the claim of Ijma on the forbidding of listening to music and singing. That's a brilliant paper. A brilliant analysis. So, uh, that was part of it. And I also looked at this book, which I want to mention. Slippery Stone by Khalid Bey. This is the most comprehensive book in English on this issue. Uh, but I had major problems with this analysis major problems. And I think at the time I need to write a rebuttal to it. There's some good stuff in it, no doubt, but some of the arguments. Now one of the arguments he talks about weak hadith here is just astonishing. Because here is a, a scholar and he's mentioning of course, he's trying to mention in his evidences authentic hadith as we're going to mention. Then he goes to the issue of weak hadith and he says well, when you have weak hadith and you have lots of them, you can put them together and one can corroborate the other and you can get sound. It's nonsense. Nonsense. It depends on the level of weakness first, as I said to you earlier on. You can't just use a willy-nilly claim like that and put it on the shoulder of Ibn al-Qayyim. Who, of course, I have great regard for and was a great scholar, the student of Ibn Taymiyyah. But I disagree with him on this issue. So he says, Khalid Bey, that lots of people saying the same thing must have some credibility. I mean, that kind of comment destroys the whole of the Ulul Hadith that the Muhaddathim built up. Because if that's the case, there's no point having a science called Ulul Hadith. Because you just go by, if lots of people are saying it, we'll accept it. So he gives the example, unbelievably, in there, he says, for example, if we have nowadays, so a road traffic accident takes place somewhere and you hear about it independently from a few people. It doesn't, he says, he argues, it doesn't really matter whether they're trustworthy, whether they can be relied on, because lots of them saying it, it's very likely just this road accident took place. Again, this is destroying the whole of Arun Hadith. You may as well not bother with this authentic Hadith if you're going to argue that. Now listen, this is a road accident. He's talking about in present day. Then compare a road accident report. Does it have much bearing on our life? Not really. Unless it's our own family that's involved. Yeah. Then compare that to the saying call of a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who said, Man kadaba alayya muta'amidan fal yatabawwa maq'adahu minan na. Whoever lies from me. Whoever lies from me with, on purpose will find their seat in the fire. And this hadith is one of the strongest hadith. It had, has many reports from many sahaba. It is mutawatir, absolute. Everybody believed this is firm. And various versions of it came warning people of staying things from the Prophet Sallallahu from his qawl and his fail, which are not true and corroborated, that they will go to the hellfire and find their seat. So you have that on one side and you compare that to an accident taking place just on the road. Let's take that further. Accident on the road. Now this accident isn't in today's world. There's no photos, there's no news reels, nobody knows about it. You only find out through word of mouth. Add to it, two centuries have gone by. Now you're hearing about this accident from 200 years ago. So are you going to still make this claim? It doesn't matter really if people are corroborated as reliable or truthful or not. We heard from the Met from about this accident taking place 200 years ago. 
Where did it take place? Can it be relied upon? How did it take place? Who was involved? What do we call this in English? Chinese whispers. That's his argument for accepting weak hadith. Unbelievable. He destroyed and contradicted the whole of Balum hadith. No point having experts if that's what you're going to make out to be okay. There are many fabricated hadith. He says, because so many people are saying it, where there's so many, actually hundreds of people in the chain. It's all a lie. Even though there's hundreds of people saying it. And the experts in hadith made it very clear. It's very easy for them to do that with their expertise. So with this method, he's going to use, if you're going to use that method, you might as well not discuss any further because you're going to, you can bring anything in. So I mentioned that. This is not the way of usul and jurisprudence. It is totally unacceptable. Otherwise, don't talk about authentic hadith at all. And great warning there in that regard. Now, to finish with, as we one out of time, to finish with, because I've been told. When we try to understand the Quranic verses and a hadith, the best, what is very important, is the, the best explanation of the Quran and Hadith are other verses of the Quran and other Hadith before you start interpreting with what you think. Quranic verses cross reference will give you an idea of what the words mean in that particular verse. And a Hadith brought together will give you that. And when you're talking about a particular issue, do not take a single Hadith on its own. Sometimes on the same hadith, you have many other versions of it with addition of words. And if they're all authentic, they all add to the understanding of that particular hadith. They say in the Lul hadith, Ziada to Thiqa Makbul. The extra that comes from a trustworthy narrator, from a different report with a few different words, is acceptable because it gives a better picture of what you're trying to understand. But many people don't do that. They just take a single hadith and just come to conclusions. You can never do this. Is not jurisprudence. This is this is nonsense. So you need to collect all the hadith, and after you sifted the weak and the fabricated, the authentic ones on that topic will help you understand what the others mean. That's how to understand the Quran ayat, and that's how to understand the hadith. Very important. Sahabas, finally, Sahabas opinion Sahaba's opinion Sahaba's opinion on trans on the explanation of a word can be taken as hujja as an argument but Sahaba differ also on their opinion on words as well but Sahaba's fatwa their legal opinion not on the word on the issue is not Absolute because they're not Rasulullah and they differed amongst themselves, which is well corroborated on many issues. On many issues. So here when we come to Sahaba, some people are sometimes, you know, I mean, for example, he uses an argument in here that Ibn Hazm has a particular view of an ayah, we'll come to it, and Abu Layl al Masood says something about a particular word in it. He says, oh, how can we, how, how can Ibn Hazm do that? Ibn, Ibn Masood is saying this. Well, Ibn Masood, first, you have to contextualize what Ibn Masood is saying as well. And read into what he's saying. It's, it's not just simple, just uh, artificial from the surface. So even though Ibn Masood says that, but other Sahaba can say the same. And therefore, Mufassirin, you see often, Tabari, Ibn Kathir, uh, Babawi, all of them, when they mention sometimes Sahaba and Tabi'in's opinion on a particular ayah, they'll put their own opinion and say, I think this is better. Because that's allowed. Yeah. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> Allah says, go, O devil, O Satan, O Iblis, go and try and befool them gradually as you wish. Go and use your sound. Now the word salt is used. Use your salt. What is the salt of shaitan? The sound of shaitan. The voice of shaitan. The Mufassirin, almost all of them have made mention of music and musical instruments. And this is a verse in Surah Al-Isa. And Allah
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, go, try and control them. Use whatever you have at your disposal. Those who know me and those who worship me, they will never follow you. So, Bismillah. With the greatest respect and uh, love for Mufti Meng, I know he's very popular. I like many of his things as well. I don't agree with everything he says, of course. We have a right to do that. Uh, notice in this ayah, he says something, and I hope you picked it up. He said, almost all the Mufassirin, is that what he said? Make mention of singing the musical instruments in regards to this, as the voice of Shaitan. So, clearly the audience when he's talking is left with the idea that this means music and singing, according to all the Mufassirin. That's what I would get from what he's saying, is that right? But it's not true. I'll show you why it's not true. This is, there's about five ayahs we're going to analyze, and this is the first of them. Where Allah SWT says, as he said, and he recited it beautifully, as he got a beautiful recitation, hasn't he? So, Wastafzis incite, agitate them, says, excite them, yeah? As much as you're able to, minhum, those you're able to, excite and incite, be salty with your voice. So, if I, I looked at a number of the Fasir, and if we go first, uh, for example, to Tafsir of Qurtabi, he says, be salty. He says, wa sawtuhu kulla da'in yadu'u ila ma'asiyatillah. His salt, the, 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 the voice of shaitan, is all that, yeah, wa sawtuhu kulla da'in, every person who calls to disobedience to Allah is his salt. And he says, Qurtubi, qil bi waswatik. And it is said by his waswasa. Because that comes in the Quran, isn't it? The one who whispers in the hearts of human beings. Um, and he mentions, al Qurtubi, that Mujahid ibn Abbas, although this report is weak, by the way, as an athar, they said, al gina wal mazamir. Singing and music and, and flutes. Imam Razi, what does he say? Bisautik. Da'ahu ila ma'asiyatil. Da'ahu ila ma'asiyatillah. He's calling, he's calling to disobedience to Allah. That's bisautik. He says, waqil. It is said, however, al gina singing and uh, play and lahu and amusement. It is said, but that's not Razi's opinion. Imam Tabari. Um, no, before I could, yeah. Imam Tabari says, same as Qurtubi. Imam Tabari says, Sawtuhu uh, kulla da'in da'ila ma'asiyatillah. He says, all who call to disobedience to Allah is the sawt, is the voice of shaitan. That's what it means. And a Tabari goes further, he says, he has nobody has a right. Nobody has a right to specify a particular sound or a particular voice excluding other voices. Nobody can specify that. It is a general use of the word so of, uh, of, uh, of shaitan. Al Zamashri Al Kashab, he said, Qil bi sautihi bi da'aihi ila al Sharb. Zamashri says that his sawt, his voice is all calling to the all that which is evil. So that's about four, four or five I've given you so far. None of them are saying what he just said. Patul Qadir, this is Imam Shawkani who mentioned earlier on his famous tafsir from over 200 years ago. 
بصوتك داعيا لهم الى معصيه الله بصوتك with your voice meaning calling them to that which is disobedience to Allah all calling to disobedience to Allah is the sound of shaitan waqil it is said when they say waqil the mufassirin they say others say this but i am of this opinion that's what they say waqil al ghina wal mazami it is said that it is singing and flutes but his opinion is all that calling to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al baydawi bi sawtik yad'a yad'aik ila al fasad you are calling to all that which is corrupt shaitan saying that's your voice al baghawi bi sawtik he mentions that qada uh, qada uh, the tabi'i said bid'aik ila ma'siyatillah you're calling to disobedience to allah that is the opinion of qada which is actually authenticated and ibn abbas says similar kull da ila ma'siyatillah fa huwa min jundu iblis and that's what bawi mentions although it's weak to ibn abbas but this is bawi's opinion all that which is a calling to disobey allah from shaitan iblis is army that is his sultik ibn ashur more recently in the last century was so yutlaq ala kalam kathir al waswata al waswasa fi nufus an nas the salt is used for all kinds of talk ibn ashur is saying in this case he's talking about the waswasa of shaitan the sharawi from Egypt be sautik be waswatik so with about 10 the fast year of giving you do any of them say what he just said they mention it some of them but that's not the opinion majority are saying actually that it is the waswas of shaitan and if you carry on look at the verse wa ajlib alayhim bi khaylika wa rajlik and attack them with your cavalry and your infantry we don't see cavalry and infantry of shaitan attacking us do we this is in a metaphoric sense yeah in other words all those who are the supporters of shaitan all those who are calling to wrong and bad they'll be trying to pull us in that direction and when you're talking about shaitan shaitan salt his voice you don't hear music and singing in your head which is telling you shaitan speaking now is waswasa the quran gives it itself quran also says wa imma yanzaghanna ka min ash-shaytani nazghun fasta'idh billah and if naz naz is incitement again a different word using the same thing and if an incitement comes to you min ash-shaytan from shaytan as a as an incitement as a naz which is waswas so this salt is the same as nazar and the same as waswas okay. what do you say a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem that a'udhu billah you say because you feel inside that you're being pulled in a direction because shaitan doesn't come with horns and a trident in front of you does he with his military as the quran is describing so it's using in a metaphoric sense and the shaitan's voice as nearly all mufassirin are saying is any calling any calling to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the salt of shaitan cannot be limited to however can it include that yes because it's any calling so if a song is lewd and calling to haram calling me to lie calling me to take drugs calling me to have affairs that would be included in salt of shaitan true or false then you can include but just per se saying any singing and music is a salt of shaitan not true that's not what the quran is saying so this evidence is not about music and singing second allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah luqman ومن الناس من يشتري لهو الحديث ليضل عن سبيل الله بغير علم ويتخذها هزوا اولئك لهم عذاب مهين انا 
amongst human beings are those who buy lahw al-hadith. Lahw al-hadith. Remember the word lahu? Malahi comes from lahu. Musical instruments. Lahu means amusement. Yeah? Includes relaxation. Yeah? Includes wasting time. Lahw al-hadith here is a discourse just passing the time. Lahw al-hadith. Lahu al-hadith. It, it means... It can mean uh, any kind of talk that you're passing the time. When we socialize, when we socialize with each other, we don't just sit and talk about Quran and Quran, Hadith, do we with each other as families or friends? Do we? That is Lahwal Hadith. That is Lahwal Hadith. It's pastime and we're just chatting with each other. Now, here, you have to understand what follows. Look what it says. Liyudilla. The key in this verse is Liyudilla and Sabiyu. It's how it's being used, the issue. Not Lahul Hadith is the problem. What is it saying? To deviate from the path of Allah. Bighayri ilmin, without knowledge. Wa yattakhidha huzuwa. And, and, that person who's using this, these words, to deviate people from the path of Allah, they take the path of Allah as a jest and a mockery. What kind of people are those? Disbelievers and monafics. Yeah? So the key is this part, to deviate other people from the path of Allah and making a mockery of the path of Allah. Yeah, taking it, Huzuwa means mockery of Sabilillah, of the path of Allah. Ulaika lahum alabum muheen. No wonder such a severe punishment. Yeah. For such people will be a shameful punishment. For what? For using Lahul Hadith? No. Liyudillah and Sabilillah. You follow me? The verse has to be understood fully. You don't just take little words out and try and come to a conclusion. The verse is saying something. Now, uh, some said again, Lahu al Hadith. Lahu al Hadith, because it's using the word Hadith here, has to be to do with words. Some tried to say uh, it is uh, drums and uh, flutes. It's impossible. It doesn't fit with Arabic language for Lahu al Hadith. Just Lahu on its own, you may get away with, but not Lahu al Hadith, because this is uh, leisurely or pastime talk. It is talk. It can fit with singing. It can fit with singing. But it is not limited to singing. Because it has to be taken in its general open meaning. Mount Tabari said the same thing with this. For those who said it is Gina, he said you cannot specify, you cannot specify the arm general meaning of the words of the Quran from the comment of anybody else except Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If the messenger of Allah specified this means specifically singing, then we take that specification. Otherwise, we're not allowed to specify. We must take the general meaning. Now, in Lahu, Ibn Faris, who's a great classical scholar of language, uh, in his dictionary of explaining the words, Mekiyas al he says, Allahu, kulla shay, shabalak and shay. Everything which keeps you busy from other things. It's basically Lahu as I described it to you. That's how they describe it there. Now, Lahu al Hadith, some people have got this idea that all Lahu is haram. And to describe this lahu al hadith, therefore, just as singing or music, is also wrong. Because in order to understand, therefore, the lahu al hadith here and make that haram, in order to understand it, you have to see what's happening in a hadith in Rasulullah's life as well. Yes, lahu generally comes in a pastime in a negative sense. We mentioned the ayah from the beginning. No, surely that the life of this world is play and amusement. Does that mean play and amusement is not allowed in Islam? You could run away with that idea. And if you're going to say this lahwal hadith here is the problem, that is haram, 
And if he's music and singing, you've got big problems. Because you're going to make Muslims, there's no play and there's no amusement left in their life at all. Let's see what happens here. Lahu we need to understand before we move on. As some of Allah said, that Lahu itself, this amusement and pastimes, has different levels. There is that which is wajib, that Lahu which is mustahab, recommending, that Lahu which is mubah, that Lahu which is makroh, that Lahu which is haram. How do we differentiate? For example, um, the Prophet said, and if you have, for example, in a battle, and this is more relevant in the past time, and the, your cavalry or the archers are some distance away from the leader, the commander, he's going to tell the trumpets to blow so they know that he wants them to fire. All right? Or the drum roll. Yeah? If we say it's, it's instruments. Now, in that instant, the playing of the trumpets and the drum roll is actually wajib because otherwise you may lose a battle because you can't communicate. They have mobile phones and all this business to communicate with each other. So that use is actually absolutely necessary. Yeah? It can become wajib in those situations. So if you're going to put instruments under lahu, right, then this is a situation where they are absolutely required. Now we have a situation also that it is reported in authentic hadith in Bukhari and Al Hakim and Al Bayhaqi that from Aisha Umm Mu'minin radiallahu anha says, "Anha zafat imra'atan ila rajul min al-ansar." فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يا عائشة ما كان معكم له فإن الأنصار يعجبهم له. Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, "Aisha gave away in marriage." A woman, because she was like the wali, by the way. A woman being a wali. Aisha Umu Mu'mineen, in this hadith, there's nothing to listen, I'm not going to go into it now. But anyway, she gave a woman away in marriage to one of the Ansaris, a man from the Ansar. And the Prophet said, Oh Aisha, did you not send any lahu with her? What was a lahu? Music and singing. He used the word lahu. He's asking her, didn't you bother sending any law in, in singing and music with her for the wedding? Because he says, ansar Because surely the Ansar, they love lahu. They love music and singing. Why would the Prophet Sassam be encouraging lahu if it is haram from this area? It can't be because he wouldn't be saying lahu here if, it is, if you're trying to make it haram from this area. You cannot un understand this ayah without taking that into context. The hadith in Bukhari and Al Hakim, which the Prophet is encouraging lahu. In another hadith, the Prophet is which is in Ahmad al Nasa'i, which is a sound hadith, and he says, Faslu ma bain al halal wal haram al duf wa sawt fin nikah. The difference between haram and halal. Haram and halal, the meaning, the difference between. Sexual relationship which is haram and sexual relationship which is halal nikah is the drums and the singing. This is authentic. This is authentic. And majority, majority certainly uh, accept it for the singing. Some have problems and try and limit it to the to the to the duff, the drums. But duff is ma'azif, ma musical instrument, isn't it? Prophet Sallallahu actually encouraging it. Again, this fits with the other hadith of Aisha just mentioned to you. Did you not take any music and singing? Because the Ansar loved this. Yeah. So here, the difference. So, keeping that in mind, this you see, therefore, Lahu, where Lahu is mustahab. Singing and music is recommended here by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi He's encouraging it, isn't he? He's not just saying, yeah, it's all right, it's going on. He's actually saying, did you not? And the difference between haram relation and halal is the playing of the instruments and the singing. So, here, in this ayah, the issue is not the lahul hadith. 
the issue is what it's being used for. Some said a report about another in the Harith, which is not authentic report, but many use it, that that was another in the Harith, with a leader, Muslim, he used to buy singing girls and musical instruments and make them play to deviate the believers from their seriousness and Islam and their teachings and their Salah. So they'll be preoccupied with this. Although this story is not true, but you can see, you can see, even if it's weak, the meaning is there in the verse. What is the purpose of the singing girls? Whereas you've got singing here and instruments for marriage, with the Prophet Sallallahu recommending. Here, the singing and instruments is being used for an evil purpose. Yes? So it's not the thing that's the problem, it's what you're using it for. That's what the Quranic verse is saying. So all lahwal hadith, yeah, that can mean, again, as they said, in the, Imam Tabari said, again, that it is general use of speech. It cannot be limited. If that speech is used to call to shirk, to call to ma'siyatillah, to disobedience to Allah, all of that will come under this category. So general application. The key, لِيُذِلَّ أَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ إِلْمِ وَيَتَّخِذَ هُزُوَى And taking religion as a mockery. Ibn Hazm used this argument, as did Shawkani, as did, uh, as, did, uh, as did others. When Ibn Hazm uses this argument, he doesn't like it, as some others didn't like it. He says, no, Ibn Hazm is wrong. He's saying the thing itself, Lahwal Hadith, is haram. He's saying if you follow Ibn Hazm's argument, then uh, khamar, drinking alcohol, if we use that word, would only be haram if it made you drunk. Is his argument correct? No, it's not. I'll tell you why. Because actually, if you look at Khamar, if Khamar came with the verse, and I'll show you the verse as well in a minute, saying, and it does do that, Khamar became haram not from a verse like this. So if we know the story of Khamar, it is an authentic hadith, that Umar bin Khattab, and the first verse that came for Khamar was, Surah Allah SWT says, They ask you about khamar, about alcohol, intoxicate, intoxicants and gambling. Say, in both of them is great sin and benefit for human beings. But the sin in both of them is greater than the benefit. Did that Prohibit khamar and gambling? No, it did not. Even though sin is mentioned here, actually. Great sin. There's no sin mentioned in Lahul Hadith here, except what it's doing, what it's being done with. Now, so Umar is reported as making dua, Allahumma bayyin lana bay, uh, uh, fil, fil khamri bayanan shifa'in. Oh Allah, make clear for us in regards to khamar. Make it so crystal clear for us in regards to this, what you want from us, in other words. So next came the ayah in uh, Surah An-Nisa, after some time. Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun. Oh, you who believe, do not come near to salah when you are drunk until you know what you are saying. This is his argument, isn't it? So this is saying, don't come near Salah while you're drunk. Come when you know what you are saying, when you come out of your drunken state. Did alcohol get prohibited in this verse? No. Because no. what's it saying? It's just saying, don't come drunk to Salah. Yeah, don't use lahul hadith to deviate from the path of Allah. So that doesn't make it haram. 
This doesn't make haram hamar here. They carried on drinking sahaba after this, true or false? They carried on, majority of them, until the last verse came. Yeah, which said, Fajitanibu, stay clear from it. And Wahal after mentioning Khamar and gambling, will you not stop? And Omar said, we will stop, we will stop. Now come, that's the evidence actually to forbid it. And it came clear, you have to stop as well, stay away from it as an order. Prohibition, you don't get that there. So Ibn Hazm is right. He's saying here, and Imam Bukhari agreed with him. Imam Bukhari also put a title in his uh, uh, book, saying chapter, Uh, yeah, Kitab is said that Bab Kullu Lah Kullu Lah in Batil Iza Shabalahu and Ta Atila. Mabuhari saying the same thing as Ibn Hazm saying that all Lahu, pastime, Batil means it's waste of time, Batil are rejected if it keeps you busy away from the obedience of Allah. Look, we put the condition Iza Shabalahu. He puts the condition of Bukhari, which is what the Quran is saying. Ibn Hajar al, uh, from Fat al Bari, who did the Tashri, an explanation of Imam Bukhari's collection, he goes on to say, say a similar thing. Khalid Beg misquotes Ibn Hajar. His translation is not correct to Ibn Hajar, because Ibn Hajar actually agrees with what Bukhari says. Ibn Hajar says, if that thing, Lahwal Hadith, whatever it is which is deviating from the obedience to Allah, is found in a text elsewhere to be haram, then it is haram. Do you agree? But that doesn't make it haram. You follow me? That evidence there in front of you doesn't make lahu al hadith haram, together with what I've said about lahu already from the Prophet. And you'll see many other evidences. Third. Time, time, time. وما كان صلاتهم عند البيت إلا مكاء وتصدية فذوقوا العذاب بما كنتم تكفرون. And their salah was was only their salah only at the in the bait is at the haram around the Kaaba. What was their worship? Their salah. What was it? It was whistling and clapping. And فَذُوكُ الْعَذَابَ وَمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْفُرُونَ So you finish the verse, don't take it just there. It doesn't say full stop. As it didn't say in the previous verse, full stop after. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَسْتَرِي لَهْوَ الْحَدِيثِ Full stop. Here again, فَذُوكُ الْعَذَابَ So taste the punishment for what you used to reject and disbelieve. Talking about kuffar. And what were the kuffar doing that they punished for? First, they were, they were being kuffar, they're rejecting. <laughs> That's what the punishment's for. And in their rejecting, they had twisted the worship around the Kaaba, which they had in Jahiliya as well, and made it into clapping and whistling. Made it into clapping and whistling. Some took that and said, all right then, clapping and whistling is around. Is that what it's saying? Is that what it's saying? It doesn't say that. It's saying they made their worship into clapping and whistling. And they were disbelievers. So if I start now worshipping and doing clapping and whistling around the Kaaba, it is haram. But clapping and whistling per se doesn't become haram because of this ayah. You follow me? Uh, others actually said, the Prophet actually saying, using the word tas, uh, 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 tasweep or clapping for Women, for example, in Salah, correcting the Imam, what did the Prophet Sallallahu said? Clapping. And for Salah, the Prophet Sallallahu said, for the man is to give the, you know, mention the, the, the word, Lukma, to the Imam. Yeah? And clapping is only for women. He used it in that context. Some said, oh, 
Clapping's allowed, but only for women. If men clap, it's not allowed in Salah. He said it in Salah. You can't take it out of Salah and now apply it generally. Yeah. But others who made clapping and whistling haram just from this ayah. And you see, it is out of context. You cannot come to that conclusion from an ayah like that. And linking it therefore with music as well. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا Here again Those who, when they witness any kind of falsehood and when they go back and buy لَهُ لَهُ is like لَهُ but لَهُ love is used more to do with words useless, vain talk Maru kirama, and that vain talk linking with zur can mean false talk, lying, backbiting, yeah, bad words, swearing, yeah. Those believers they pass by with dignity, they don't get involved in that. That's what it's talking about. What to be says from Ibn Abbas, this zur is the uh, the festivals of the mushrikeen. The Muslims, their festivals, because it involves falsehood and worshipping idols and shirk. Yeah? Uh, Ibn al Arabi, Az Zur, all lies, Al Kabib, Bakullu Ma Yarju Ilayhi. Any kind of lie and falsehood is under Zur. <coughs> because some try to say this Zur, this falsehood, is to do with singing and music. Again, how do you specify? Without any evidence. You know why they specify? Because they have already got in their mind a hatred for singing and music and they're trying to transplant it into the verse. But people of real knowledge about this issue, you'll see, even from the last verse of the Quran, you'll find that there is no evidence absolutely in the Quran about making music haram or makru. Neither this verse either. Uh, in the Arabi, as he said, all kinds of lies uh, comes under this uh, fal falsity. Uh, he says, "Amma qawm bi annahu hina al qurtubi." Uh, Ibn Arabi says, "Sorry." Uh, as far as the statement that this is singing, "Falisa yantahi ila had al had," it doesn't get limited to this. Same thing what Dabri said again before. You can't limit it by just this statement that this is. It may be that you, again, like I said before, that you use songs with shirk and falsity and lies in it, then it will come under there. But not just per se being a song. <clears throat> uh, in the it says it's shirk is to do with the festivals of the mushrikeen, it is to do with false witness, yeah, and love is to do with all that which is false. Wahidi, as Shawkani says, Al Wahid, the famous great Mufassid, that Al Wahidi says, Aksar Mufassirin Allah and Nazur Hahuna bi ma'na shirk. The majority of Mufassirin, Al Wahidi says, are uh, that Zur here, falsehood means has the meaning of shirk, involvement with anything to do with shirk in the, in, in the, uh, in the statement. So the ma'na is, uh, uh, and Shawkani says, the ma'na is general. Its meaning is general. It means lies and falsehood. Uh, and lahu means all kinds of uh, 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 um, um, maxia or uh, disobedience of Allah. Okay, here, uh, I mean, this is Surah Najm at the end of it. Afa min hadha al hadithi ta'jaboon wa tadhakoon wa la tadhkoon wa antum wa antum samidoon.
Some tried to say, Antum Samidu, while you amuse yourself, this is his singing and music again. But even those who said singing and music, some said it even by Ibn Abbas, for example, says it, he's saying, Huwalgina, Kanu, Ida Sami ul Quran, Tahannu, Tahannu, Walaibu. When they used to hear the Quran, who's it talking about? Mushriks and disbelievers. They used to sing loudly and make a, a clatter and a noise. So if you want to understand Samidun, this doesn't just mean because you're amusing yourself, but it's wrong. It's when they're doing it. It's talking about the Quran. I mean, had hadith ta'jabun. Are you not then amazed by this hadith, this statement, the Quran? That you will laugh rather than weep. You laugh rather than weep. Does that make laughing haram, by the way, this verse? Because you have to make it haram as well if you're going to make Samirun haram. You understand me? And that means you have to cry all the time as well. Because the co contrast of laughing is that you should be crying. And you should cry every time you hear the Quran. No, it's not saying that. It's talking about those who crying because of their, they should be crying. Allah SWT is putting it in such a way, you're laughing and mocking at it, actually your, your situation is, should really make you cry because you're sinners and you're going to get to hellfire. It's not saying you should cry instead. It's not, so the, so the believers standing listening to Surah Najm weren't all crying by the way, were they? I can tell you they weren't from the Sahaba. But the disbelievers were making mockery of it. So the Quran wasn't saying to the believers, you start crying while they're laughing. It's using it in a rhetorical sense. But you should be ashamed of yourself, your sins, what's in store for you, you should be crying. But you're making mockery of it. And again, mockery was of Antum Samidun. Yeah? Which is what Ibn Abbas is saying. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, um, says it in this verse. This verse goes with the other verse to clarify for you. And disbelievers are saying, don't listen to the Quran, but uh, uh, have the Quran وَأَلْغَوْ from love. Yeah, uh, means, as he's saying, either by singing or going, oh, 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 oh. so that you overcome the recital of the Quran by making lots of noise. Yeah, so if you do that by either words or singing or anything, making a loud noise with anything, even in, in, includes musical instruments and singing, then it comes under that category. Yeah? Not the fact that amusing and samidun, amusing, is haram. Amusement is haram. We get in contrast to that Prophet Sallallahu Therefore, we have to look, did he amuse himself ever, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He's mentioning already, I haven't come to the hadith, he's already mentioning for wedding people that, that the Ansar are well known. And by the way, this statement, Ansar, loving, loving, singing and, uh, and singing and musical instruments continued for a couple of centuries, by the way. They were famous, Medina and Hijaz, Medina and Mecca, were famous during the time of the Tabi'een and Tabi'i Tabi'een for places who, where they liked singing and music still after the time of Rasulullah It was only after a couple of hundred years and some scholars who were more stricter and they had their reasons to do with culture, etc. Then they had, but they still mention in the history books. Imam Dhabi mentions it. Uh, Ibn Qudama mentions it in Mughni that the people of Medina are famous for life, for loving music and singing. And then Ibn Qudama in Mughni mentions this hadith, which I mentioned to you earlier from the Prophet Sallallahu that the Ansar love. <laughs> we'll stop there. These were the chronic. Uh, inshallah, we'll come back and uh, go on to the. Uh, this audio is brought to you by Muslim Central.
Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. You're talking about walking in the supermarket and the music is playing or any of the stores. You're talking about watching the news and it starts with music and ends with music. You're talking about, when you talk about music, watching even um, a documentary of wildlife and the lions chasing the gazelle and it has music. And I think to myself, sometimes the music goes off and imagine how boring that would be. But you're talking about all that, if you're going to say haram, it includes all those situations and more when you say haram. Funny thing is that, including uh, Hard Bay and others, they even then go on further to say, because if they make music haram, they'll say, therefore beatboxing, which is making music. I can understand if they're going to say it, yeah, I would, I would agree with them, because otherwise they would be playing tricks. There are those who say, well, as you know, there are those who, from the she singing, they thought, we'll make it Islamic, we won't have really the musical instruments, I'll do it with my mouth. That just goes back to the same idea of singing. Singing has melody, and so do instrument, instruments, music have melody. So you can't use the issue of, and this is one of the things he uses, and others, others like him, which I found really distasteful from Ulama scholars use, the idea of tarb. If it has melody, then it is haram. If it is a melody, it is haram. So we allow singing, but it mustn't have melody. And we don't have inst instruments because it has melody. Duff all will allow it, it's not, it hasn't got much melody. That is just, it's a silly argument. So again, the idea is beatboxing, making music with that, will also become under haram as well. And the funny thing I found with many of these uh, 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 brothers, I'm not going to use the, the term for their mother or whatever, but you know, the program from when they say music is now an introduction into a YouTube video, is a musical singing, uh, ah, it's a melody, you know. And they're saying on their video, music and singing is haram. Your introduction itself, you must make haram as well then, before the, the program comes on. Anyway, so when we say music, we have to include all those situations that we find ourselves steeped in, actually. That's how we find ourselves. So you'd have to, in that sense, be committing haram all the time. All the time. That's the consequence of when you say. That's not the reason for not making it haram. I'm just putting the scenario to you. The consequence of saying this is haram, this is what it means for us all. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, going back to what I said earlier, created for us sight, vision and hearing. And also created in the nature for us to look at beautiful things and listen to beautiful things. We like to hear, it's a blessing, isn't it, from Allah? Yeah. I like to hear the stream and the birds sing, a nice, anything, that, a nice voice, a nice voice, which is melodious. Prefer that than the shouting and screaming like my lecture now. It's not melodious, is it? So, I don't want to sing, I could sing it to you, I suppose, but I'm not going to. <laughs> that would be really controversial, wouldn't it? Um, so, we like to hear that, and therefore the Quran says, "Inna ankar al aswati la sautul hamid." Show you that the worst of sounds is that of a donkey brain. Poor donkey. <laughs> but it's not donkey that we have to go and kill it because it's brain. Don't get that idea. But you compare the donkey brain to a bird singing and a lark singing. Yeah, there's a, a world apart. So Allah blessed us with hearing, not to shut it, yeah, anything, anything to do which sounds nice. Yeah. And hence, even the Quran, as I was saying to the brothers here, and I'll mention this first, that the Prophet Sallallahu in many authentic hadith, more than one, he said, Zayinu, Quran bi aswatikum, beautify the Quran with your voices. That's not only for males, by the way. As we often take it with that male chauvinism. Oh, that's for males, women, we can't hear them. Some of them, they said, there's no difference between a woman singing, singing a song, whatever it is, and reciting the Quran. Where did that nonsense come from? Because, you know, the men can get sexually attractive <laughs> even when she's reciting the Quran. 
The problem's in the male who's listening. If he's going to get sexually attracted when the Quran's being recited, either he doesn't understand Arabic, right? Because that would make him shake and not think about that, which is what he should be. That's what, that's what it means, listening to the Quran, so it affects our hearts. Or uh, the, the, the disease is in the heart. And that's how Allah SWT explains it in the Quran in regards to women as well. Yeah. In regards to women, in fact, speaking. And uh, the issue of the is the woman's voice aura or not. Those who try and use, they try and use a verse in the Quran. Um, Talking to Ummahat al Mu'mineen in Surah Al Ahzab. Allah SWT says, Subhanallah. It's there. It tells you everything there. You don't need to go off into tangents. So it says, and do not, tahda'na bil qawl can in simplest terms mean saying to Ummahat al Mu'mini, this is di being directed by the way. You are not like other women, then Allah says, do not, superficial translation means do not lower your voices in speech. Some said, do not lower your voices uh, 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 in, in sound, but actually it's saying bil qawl. And it's not lowering your, because you can't, lowering your voice is to do with sound. Lowering your speech, it doesn't make sense. So, khada here, also, I found, uh, and I was thinking over this for years, actually, I kept on thinking, it can't just mean lowering your voice. Don't lower your voice. Women's voice tends to be lower intensity anyway. What's she going to do with it? So, it, and some said, came up with the idea, she needs to speak like a man. Oh, <laughs> speak like that to a man, so he doesn't get any attraction. It doesn't say that. You have to make, some actually said the woman has to make her voice masculine. Really, they did. And they still believe that. There's <laughs> some. Tahdana bil qawl al qamus al muhit. One of the uh, classical scholars of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 early uh, language says, Khada fulana ila yani da'ahu ila su. Khada fulana. Khada here can mean lowering, but in this case, I always thought it means talking in a, 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 a way of, um, um, how do you call it? Um, that's not the word, a blank. Um, not quite provocative, that's a bit strong, but it, um, to try and, um, uh, in, 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 how do you say, induce? No, not induce. Entice. 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 Entice, that's the word I'm looking for. Okay. Yes, talking like that to a man. Don't do that. Yeah? <laughs> in, in an enticing voice. Yeah? So, and yet when it says, and it's not voice actually, Bill old. Old means enticing words. Don't use enticing words. Even in that case, the problem's elsewhere. You know where the problem is? In the man. Yes, yeah, so Allah is saying, for the one who has disease in their heart might be looking for some hope. So when you hear the woman reciting the Quran, the mud is there in your hearts. And why is it? Why is it that when you put it the other way around and the man recites, do women have no feelings? That's another problem with our history of scholarship. When you go with scholars, because of the male chauvinism, you get this feeling on every subject that you uh, study, that women are like creatures who have no sexual desire or feelings, it's just men. They're just sexual objects, and men are just sitting there hankering. Right? So actually, the man reciting Quran can also produce feelings in the females as well. So why don't you put a stop to that as well? And here, وَقُلْنَا قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا Saying to the women, speak as you normally do. Ma'rufa means as normal. Here, not just speak. وَقُلْنَا means speak as normal conversation. In other words, you'll have to have normal conversation with men. It's actually saying it. Speak. And it's saying it to the wives of the Prophet Speak to men. 
But then screening came more than any other woman because they were never going to marry anybody else after Rasulullah so they were a special case. And even for them, it's Allah's ordering them. Speak, meaning to the men, as you know, as, uh, for normal things, just speak everyday things. Are you allowed to speak to the opposite sex? The Quran is saying, yes, you are, even for Ummahat al -Mu'minin. So what about the Quran? Zayinu, the Quran, be aswati, beautify the Quran with your voices, male and female. The Prophet says in, In one hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet says, Ma adina Allahu li shay, ma adina lin nabi an yatahanna bil Qur'an. That Allah, and adina here is listen. Allah doesn't, Allah likes to uh, uh, listen to nothing better than listening to uh, the, the Prophet singing the Qur'an. An yatahanna bil Qur'an. Yatahanna, singing the Qur'an. Ghanna, taghanna is singing the Qur'an with melody and not which goes with beautify the Quran with your voices some tried to change that hadith because they didn't like it which is not authentic beautify your voices with the Quran it's not saying that it came in many reports it's beautify the Quran with your voices yeah and other hadith came to clarify that that the Prophet like he said in this one he's talking about in one version it says Hassan is salt yet a Quran. The beautiful voice singing the Quran. Singing the Quran. So there you have melody in actually singing of the Quran. It is a music. It is a melody. There's tongue in it. Yeah. The Imam reciting going up and down in the, in the emotion, in the melody, it affects the heart. Yeah. Uh, and some some ulama came to speak even against that. They said, oh, no, no, this is Ilhan. Ilhan is a word you'll hear. It is used, but Ilhan has multiple meanings. One of the meanings of Ilhan, clearly, uh, is melody. But another meaning of Lahan or Ilhan is to pronounce the Arabic words incorrectly. Get the grammar wrong. Get the grammar wrong. Yeah. So if you're reciting and you're grammatically making mistakes, then you also are doing, are doing an ilham. That kind of ilham is not acceptable, as much as you're able to. But the melody of reciting, you find it even with the adhan, don't we? In the hadith, the sahabi who came, Abdullah ibn Abdul Rabb, wasn't told to give the adhan, was he? Even though he's the one who got the words from his dream. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, now give those words to Bilal. What did he say? Huwa anda minka sawt. His voice is more melodious than yours. So how? Some try to translate that and say he's got a louder voice than yours. What? So he can shout louder? I'm sure the London of the rock would shout top of his voice as well if he was standing on a, a hillock as well. Nonsense. This is to do with melody. His voice is melodious. Now we come to the hadith. And I'm sorry I haven't put the translation in, for next time we'll try and uh, uh, sort that out, but it doesn't help you much. The first one, uh, the Prophet said, this is in Ahmad Abu Dawud, these hadith are all authentic, sahih, which I'm going to mention now. لَيْسَ مِنَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا ثَلَاثَةً مُلَعَبَةُ الرَّجُلْ أَهْلَ وَتَعْدِيدِهِ فَرْسَ وَرَمْيَةُ بِقَوْسِ Here, Prophet said saying that uh, Uh, it is not from Lahu, these things are acceptable Lahu, pastimes. That's what he's saying, Salah There are three things which are acceptable pastimes, Lahu. Acceptable types of amusement and relaxation. What? Malabutu Rajal Ahla. Ahla here doesn't mean family. Playing of a husband with his wife. That means vice versa as well, doesn't it? Yeah? When you see the man playing with his wife being as part of acceptable amusement, it means the other way around as well. Don't they say the wife's not allowed to play with the husband, it's only the husband playing with the wife, and she's just a recipient. And this play has wide meaning, brothers and sisters. From intimacy to 
leisure time spending husband and wife, like the Prophet started racing with his wife, Umar Mu'min and Aisha. And you don't have to specify, you don't come from this and say from the hadith of Aisha, the only thing a husband's allowed to do in playtime with the wife is race, because that's what the Prophet says on this. Do we? And I'll tell you, scholars do that. They'll do it with when we come to some of the musical instruments. Just limit it for no reason. Rather than getting the message from it. Even when it's saying three, it doesn't limit to three. Because we also have you know, another written narration which mentions four. Anyway, the other thing in the narration is horse riding. Training horse riding. Okay. The other... Ramya to be posting, which is target practice, if you can say, you know, it's, it's uh, bow and arrow, but not before bow and arrow, now you can use rifle, they didn't have rifle in those days, yeah, target practice. So can we add to this list? Of course you can, of course you can. Where there's benefit, that's what the idea is. And benefit sometimes, in, in, in um, Um, benefit sometimes in one hadith which is also authentic mentioned in the Sai and Tabrani similar to this the Prophet said four things not three and he mentioned there walking between two goals anything for doing a, a, a purpose in other words a venture for a purpose uh, uh, learning to swim, he added to that. So you can add to that. You know? If I sit, for example, at home, which I sometimes, well, I often do, I'm told, just like that at home, men like doing that, don't we? <laughs> we like to be now. I'm just doing nothing. This is called level. Right? Is that hard? So we are reflecting, you know, I mean, I'm only thinking of nothing. Sometimes I think of nothing, empty here, which is very easy. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Is it also? No, it's not. It's less true, normal. This is low as well. Am I allowed to do that? Of course I am. Yeah, so we need to think of, of those. So the scenarios here in this hadith is showing you, again, this is to show you that interpretation of lahu al hadith and lahu as blatantly and across the board being haram is against this hadith and all the possibilities under the hadith of things that you can do which are uh, useful now in the same sense even those these uh, pastimes are being mentioned leisure time is good rising i love riding a horse now if i ride the horse and gamble with it it takes me to a different category the horse riding is not the problem, is it? We must dis we must differentiate between the two to realize where the ruling is coming from. It is the gambling where the problem is. Yeah. Same confusion they're running to in regards to chess and backgammon. Some who made chess and backgammon haram, they couldn't see that it became haram. Uh, either it could be makru because you're wasting hours and days and days of playing, right? Then it become on the karaha, especially if it takes you away from other good things, that better things you could be doing. But it becomes haram if you're betting with it, not per se, just as an amusement. So this, this is what ulama need to think about, about where, where the situation, what is the situation here? What are we actually talking about? This hadith is in Bukhari and others. This is... Uh, the most famous hadith, even though even Hazm rejects this be, uh, hadith as being uh, authentic, the most popular opinion amongst muhaddithin is this hadith is authentic. But we need to understand this hadith with all the other ahadith of the Sallallahu Alaihi which we'll come to. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was heard, the Sahabi is reporting, saying, uh, saying, there will be a people from my ummah who will make halal uh, 
adultery, silk, khabar, alcohol, and ma'azif. What's ma'azif? Musical instruments. And there will be a people who will be uh, descending to the side of the mountain. Uh, people will come shepherds with their flocks to them. The poor from amongst them will come to them for their needs. For Yakulu, these people who are living at the side of the, the mountain, they must be rich and well off. If they say, so they will instead for those poor people asking they will say come back tomorrow to us um, and at night time during the night Allah will throw the mountain on them destroy them others Allah will change and metamorphosize into monkeys and pigs till the day of judgment this is the hadith this hadith is authentic and what is the meaning in this? Firstly, this hadith is a khabar. What does khabar mean? It's information. It is not coming in the form of insha'a, they call it in Arabic, which is when the Quran or hadith comes and say, you must not do this. You must not do this. Right? Or you must do this, that's an order. You must not do this, that's forbidding. It hasn't come in that, uh, uh, in that form. It's coming in the form of information. Not only information, sometimes you can have khabar, which comes in the form of a commandment as well. But that is something like, uh, That is an example of that. Men are but the protectors and... Uh, the protectors and carers of women because what all extra Allah has given them and because they spend of their wealth on them that is a statement it doesn't say men you must be protectors it's saying men are the protectors of women as a statement but that statement the way it comes has the meaning of it's an obligation and that's where ulama get the obligation of men being the providers in Muslim family uh, and households and not the women they're not the, the, the responsible in this case, however, it's talking about prophecy for the future. You do not find in any prophecy for the future something where a legal ruling is given. A, a legal ruling being produced in this format. If you look at each of the things which are mentioned here, and the ones who are against music, musical instruments, this is the main source of their evidence they use. They say, look, Prophet said, Yastahilluna, they will make halal. They say yastahil can only be used for that which is haram and they're making it into halal. But, but, that is not so. Because we have another hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu mentions about a person, and this is uh, a Sahih hadith uh, in uh, uh, Ahmad and Tirmidhi, in here. There's a rebuttal. When the Prophet says, hadith min hadithi, fama wajatna fihi min halal wama wajatna fihi min al haram In this hadith, Prophet said, uh, Soon a person will come who will be leaning back on their cushions and hadith will come from one of my hadith, one of my hadith will come to him. And what will he say? He will say, between us and you is just the book of Allah. In other words, he's rejecting hadith of the Prophet. And he goes on to say, and whatever we found in the book from halal, istahlalnahu, we made it halal. In this case, he's saying whatever we found halal, we using the word istahlal nahu. So the argument those who use that making haram into halal is the time that istahl, that form of word is used, is defeated. Because here, 
the Prophet is using it from halal to halal. So it doesn't have to be that everything that's mentioned that they're doing istihlal of is haram. You follow me? Some of you follow me. It's a bit technical. It's to do with the word you're making halal, istahalla the word. Okay? Istahlal. And they're trying to argue that you can only use it. It's only used when something haram is made into halal. But I'm showing you a hadith where halal is made into halal by the book. That's how it's been used in language. So you can't use that argument, number one. Number two. Here, you can't use this hadith because we don't get the fact that zina is haram from this hadith. Do we? It's in the Quran, clearly. Do not go near zina. And other ayat about zina. Another hadith which make it clear that zina is haram. Not from this hadith. We don't get the fact that khamar is haram from this hadith. We already know it's haram in this hadith from other texts. <coughs> other texts. Silk. Silk is mentioned here, wearing of silk. Is it haram for everybody? No. It's haram for women. And can you imagine when you put this together, and if you're going to accept it on face value, how is wearing of silk, even for a male, the same level of sin as doing zina and drinking khamar? Is it? For those who understand Mabas, they know ulama with deep thinking that sins are not all the same level, are they? They're of different levels. But here they've been put together all as one group and look at the punishment. The mountain being thrown on in this world and being turned into monkeys and pigs in this world. It's a big punishment for just wearing silk. <laughs> when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for men even allowed it for somebody with eczema or uh, you know skin condition, not for life and death reasons. Just for discomfort. It's fine, you can wear it. So you've got that there in there. And it has a ruling for women which is halal anyway. Then you come to Ma'azif. Now if you're going to say that this is making it haram, remember what Ma'azif means? All instruments. All instruments. Then you're going to have to understand this hadith from other ahadith I'm going to bring you. That will make you realize that you cannot single out here the instruments here and they're haram because of this hadith. What it's actually saying, and it is clarified actually, there are other reports of it uh, as well. In one report, these are also authentic from Ibn Abi Shayba. The Prophet said it's the same hadith with different words, which gives you a bit more, a, 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 a more understanding of what's going on in the other one. Say, fi ummati al wal masak wal qazaf. They will be from my ummah, my ummah, from the believers of Prophet Sallallahu Yeah, metamorphosis, uh, uh, tough one, just, um, yeah, sir. That's being swallowed by the, 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 the earth. Masaf, uh, metamorphosis into monkeys and pigs and qadaf, that is the mountain being thrown on people. All the Sahabi saying, Bult, I said, Fima ya Rasulullah, for what reason, O Messenger of Allah? All, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al qaynat wa shurbihim al humur. Because of them taking kainat are women singers and drinking khamar. So if you just take this hadith on its own from this, when it's put with khamar, you could come to the conclusion that having women singers is haram. Because look at the punishment. But you haven't finished with the other hadith, so to clarify now. This last one makes it even clearer. Here, notice, before we go to the last version of it, was shuru al khumur. Not istahlalna, but drinking khamar. They are from my ummah. And in one version it says, uh, they say, la ilaha illallah. But they're involved in this kind of thing, drinking khamar. And here, iza dhaharatil ma'azim. When will this happen? When instruments and drinking of alcohol and wearing a skill will become rampant. Dhaharat. It'll be everywhere. Amongst who? Amongst his ummah. 
Look at the Hadith context and then we understand the whole of the picture. That you have a context in which alcohol is flowing, adultery is being encouraged and happening. Yeah, and in that some people are wearing silk as well and they've mixed it with music. So that kind of setting, which is the setting of most nightclubs, yeah, is the setting which is being actually punished. So take the whole picture. So those scholars who said this is not individually to be taken, it is taken as a full picture. And that's the only way you can take it. That's the only way you can take it, I'm going to put it to you, because we'll see from the other hadith, it cannot be from this hadith that it is singling out making instruments haram. You can only understand that by looking at other authentic hadith. Follow me? Here we have an authentic hadith reported by Ibn Jarir, Ibn Jarir al Tabari, the famous Mufassir. This hadith is mentioned by Ibn Jarir, it is authentic, about the context of the verse to do with Surah, uh, Surah Al-Jum'ah Where Allah SWT says And when they see business and commerce going on lahu, Both in the same boat Or amusement in faddu ilayha, They go rushing away towards it So what happens in the authentic hadith That it is mentioned that Like this hadith That somebody is getting married So Kanal Jawari the young ladies from the Asar are coming out with their double-sided drums and what else? Mazamir? Flutes. They're playing them in the street because there's a wedding going on. So, those sitting in the masjid and the Prophet in the member is doing khutbah. They leave and come out to see what the commotion is going on. And in one report, which is also authentic, it was one of the uh, Sahaba coming back after a business trip and people wanted to know Deha Kalbi Deha Kalbi, the famous companion and people came out rushing where he's been etc etc, same context firstly the Quranic verse criticizing this is criticizing it because people are leaving the Prophet at khutbah in Salatul Jum'ah to come out that's what the problem is, not the singing and the flutes and the drums, which are already encouraged by the Prophet Sallallahu in other ahadith for marriage, are they not? Yes. So when they're doing it here, what's the problem? The problem is when you leave the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi standing in khutbah, not any imam, the messenger of God. So the Quran therefore has a go at those who do that, but it doesn't leave it to musical instrument. It includes in that tijara. So ulama who said, if you're going to use this to criticize music, then you better also say tijara and commerce is also haram. Because it's in the same context he's saying it. Yeah? Wa ra'aw tijaratan aw lahwanin faddu ilayha. When they see business and commerce or amusement, both in the same book. So if you're going to make that haram because of this, then you must make the other haram because of it as well. You follow me? And we know business is not haram, but it becomes haram when Salatul Jum'ah is going on because of the context. Same with the amusement, yeah? for the wedding especially here. But here it shows you also that flutes are being played as well as drums, it's not just drum. The flutes are not being criticized, it's what the purpose is. Okay, this one Ahmed and Abu Dawood. Fakadra wa Ahmed wa Abu Dawood wa Ibn Haddan as well in his Sahih, the collector of Hadith and a critic of Hadith. And Nafir, Mawla Ibn Umar, very famous Hadith from Nafir, who's a slave of Ibn Umar. Nafir is a, a scholar, reporter of Hadith, the form, most famous chain going to Imam Malik from Ibn Umar, uh, Nafir to Malik. 
the golden chain they call it but in, in, in this case we're not on about that but it, from Ibn Umar but, and now Ibn Umar Samia sold Zamara to Ra'in that um, that Ibn Umar Nafis with him in companionship and as they're riding along that Ibn Umar hears the sound of the flute of the shepherd he puts his fingers in his ears Ibn Umar does and he diverts the animal he's on whether it's camel or horse away from the sound وَعَدْلَ رَاهِلَتَهُ عَنِ الْقَرِيْهِ وَهُوَ يَقُولُ And he's saying, يَا نَافِ أَتَسْمَعْ And in, a, in another way, he keeps asking him, can you hear it still? So Nafi says, yes. So then he asks him again, a little bit further. Yeah? أَتَسْمَعْ uh, Until he says, لَا فَوَدَعَ يَدَيْهِ Then he puts his fingers out of his ears. When Nafi says, I can't hear it anymore. And then he brings back back to the original the root of his animal. Ibn Umar says this is what the Messenger of Allah did in a similar situation when he heard the, 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 the shepherd playing the flute. This is what he did. Those who say the flute now is haram music is haram they use this verse those who say it's allowed strongly use this hadith as well i'll tell you how those who say it's haram say oh look he's doing this and the prophet sallallahu did this so it must be haram all right that's one thing and he's diverted his uh, animal from him okay let's look at a different way First with Ibn Umar, who's with the Messenger of Allah. Why is it that the Messenger of Allah is doing this and Ibn Umar, he didn't tell him to do this. Is Ibn Umar not Muslim? <coughs> if it is haram, is it haram only for the Messenger, not for Ibn Umar? Why did the Prophet Islam not deviate and tell Ibn Umar also to do this if it's haram? Not only that, as Ibn Umar tells Nafi, Prophet Islam told Ibn Umar as well, can you listen out please? Why is he listening? It's haram. Yeah, he's listening. Can you listen out until it stops? It can't be haram, otherwise he'd be telling Ibn Umar, by the way, this is haram, you need to do this as well. On, and then Ibn Umar would have told Nafi the same thing. Is Nafi not a Muslim? He's a Muslim scholar for goodness sake. But Ibn Umar doesn't tell him to do this either. Doesn't tell him to do this either. Number two, why didn't they, because if you could hear the flute, so the ulama quietly said, why did the Prophet Sallallahu and then after that Ibn Umar, go to the shepherd and say, Astaghfirullah, I've been sent to destroy flutes and, with, uh, and uh, string instruments, as you find in a very weak uh, hadith. Why did he go and do that? And destroy his flute? Some, uh, the, the ones who were opposing said, oh, well, it was a bit far away, that's why he didn't go. <laughs> Come on, you can hear it. You can't be that far away. And if it's so hated and so haram, then you go and stop the, 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 the shepherd as well. Or why didn't he clarify at the time to in the hour as well? They didn't. So why did he do this? The best explanation for that is the Prophet Sallallahu As you see, similar situation with another hadith on the day of Eid. The Prophet Sallallahu is in a different state. But he allows the Sahaba to carry on, including his wife. Same here, like Umar Mu'min Ashraf that the Prophet Sallallahu his preference was to remember Allah Kulla Ahyan. Can the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam yadkur Allah Kulla Ahyanin? The Prophet Sallallahu used to make, remember Allah all the time, sitting, lying, and you would expect that this is a messenger of God. So he's doing something, that's why the ulama suggests, if he's going along and doing this, he must be doing something better and he doesn't want to be disturbed by the sound of the flute of the shepherd. And that's the best way to understand this hadith. Now we're coming to more and more interesting ones. So many hadith. 
This comes in many, many forms, this hadith in Bukhari Muslim. And as I come to this, let me clarify something else. There are various hadith you're going to see, and we saw one already. See that one? Kan al Jawari. Jawari. This is a definition needed again. What is Jawari? Or Jariya. Jawari or Jariya has various meanings. And I'll tell you what the meaning is in this case. Uh, some of the meanings of Jariya, Jariya can be used for a ship on the ocean because it comes from Jara, uh, which means to flow or to sail along or to uh, go along. So Jariya is used for a ship on the ocean. Jariya is used um, Al Jawari Al Kunnas is Surah. Um, yes, in Surah Taqweed. Al Jawari Al Kunnas, the plural of Jari. Jawari is a star which is going to set, is flowing in the direction of setting. The star that sets. Uh, and Jariya, um, in this case, he claims that Jariya always means, well, in all these hadith, means little girls. Little girls, which means not Bali. In other words, if they're little girls, they can do whatever they want. They're not answerable for anything other. So he'll try and use this translation here. But I beg to differ very strongly with that comment, and I'll show you why. Jariya can be used for an Amma, who is a lady and adult, which is a slave woman. A slave, adult woman, the word Jariya can be used for her. Yes, Jariya can be used for a little girl as well, but Jariya can also be used for a young lady. For a young lady. Why? So he will translate in this hadith, Kano Jawari, little girls were going along. I say no, young ladies were going along actually. Because the hadith that we're going to deal with now, here again, is the day of Eid. And it comes in lots of narration of this hadith. Very famous hadith, nobody can deny it. They try and get round it, but other ways. That Aisha Umul Mu'mineen reports that it was the day of Eid, and ja two young ladies were with me from the Ansar. They were singing and playing the Duf in the house of the Messenger of Allah. This house has got five rooms. It's Aisha's apartment, Umu Mu'minin, where when the Prophet used to pray, Aisha used to be lying in front of him. It's that small. And when he was to go down and sit there, he used to tap on her feet so she would pull her legs up. So he could go down to do. In that place, those two young ladies are playing the drums and singing songs. What are they singing? Nasheed? La ilaha illallah, la ilaha. That's, you know, some will say that's all you're allowed to sing, you know. Muhammad. No, they're singing from, they're singing songs from the Battle of Bu'ath. The Battle of Bu'ath is that which takes place for the uh, Khazraj and Ansar, the Ansar, when they fought against each other before the Prophet arrived to Medina in times of Jahliya. That's the battle they're singing, singing about. They're singing, that's what they're singing about. But obviously there's no shirk and wrong in it, but he's not praising Allah and his messenger and all this. He's singing a song. And the Prophet is in the same apartment, same room, and he's got his back to them. In one report, he's lying down and he's got his head covered with his back to them. And Allah is doing dhikr. He's doing dhikr. Abu Bakr, I should say, is her father, walks in and he's shocked with this. says, Mezmar shaitan fi bait in the bua, fi bait in the bee. The, the, uh, the, the instruments, the instruments of shaitan in the, uh, the house of uh, the messenger. Here, mazamir is being used in a musical instrument sense because they weren't mazamir, they were actually playing drums. Mazamir means flutes. So he's using it in an instrument sense. The instruments of, uh, you know, shaitan in the house of the messenger of Allah. So the Prophet heard him say that. 
And keep this in mind, he used the word shaitan. Prophet didn't correct Abu Bakr on that, but he corrected what he was trying to do, which was to stop them. So the Prophet actually took off the cover and turned around and said, Da'hum or Da'hunna, leave them alone, Ya Abu Bakr. Leave them alone. This day is the day of Eid. Every people, nation has their festivals, and this is our festival. Leave them alone to carry. This report and another report, which is linked with the same day, comes at the end of this hadith and sometimes in separate hadith. On the same day, in the mosque, Aisha Umu Mu'mini mentions that she and the messenger were sitting down. Suddenly they heard a loud noise in the masjid of the Habash. The Abyssinians had come and they were playing and dancing, Yaspinuna, jumping up and down with their, and playing with their sword, their, their spears and their shields. And you know, when we've seen any Hollywood movie, how they, they make sound with the noise of their shields as they do their uh, 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 sort of folk dance, traditional dance. You know, they call it folk dance, dabka. Dabka they call it in Arabic. Dabka to the Shahbiya. So the three Africans, that's the kind of thing they were doing in the masjid. And we heard a loud noise of Sibian. Young children were also, you know, around them. Because it's entertainment going on. So the Prophet Sassam asked me, do you want to watch the, the, the Abyssinians doing their performance and their play in the masjid? And it was a day of Eid. And I said, yes. And I was a Jariya at the time. In one report, she says, I was a Jariya at the time. What does that mean? If it means little girls, as he claims, it's not possible. She's already moved in with the Messenger of Allah and is a wife to the Messenger of Allah. So Jaria can, is not limited to little girls. She's a young lady. She's a married woman. And she's saying, I was a Jaria at that time. You follow me? So Jaria, Jaria is not limited to little girls who haven't re reached uh, Baloog and maturity because she's already in with the Prophet Sallallahu living with him as his wife. And you know what? In one report, Umm uh, Mukminin Aisha Dariana, she says, "Fakdiru qadru jariyat al haditha al sin al harisa ti ala Allahu." This is in the Sahih in Ahmad. She says, "Imagine the value for a young lady like myself of young age for her excitement and desire to listen to amusement." That's what I was like. For amusement. She would use the word lahu here. Yeah. Harisati al lahu. Eager for amusement. Wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is saying this. So when the Prophet said, Do you want to watch them? Forget it being haram. Do you want to watch them? This is after they've been playing also music and singing in the house of the Prophet. Music and singing. So how can then you make it haram when it's happening in the, 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 the Are you following Abu Bakr or the Messenger of God? Radiallahu anhu, Messenger of Allah corrected him and said, Leave them alone. And then this is going on in the masjid of Rasulullah. Sallallahu and Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha, as he says, So he covered me, Rasulullah. Sallallahu and we stood at the doorway. Some said there was a curtain in the doorway, there's no evidence for it. We stood at the doorway and I had my cheek next to the cheek of my beloved, touching his cheek, like here, while I was watching the Abyssinians perform. And while they were performing this, uh, this time Omar walks in. Before it was Abu Bakr, now it's Omar's turn. Seeing this happening in the masjid, jumping up and down and doing this with their shields and thinking, uh, right? So Omar says, oh, he, he, he tries to stop them, telling them off. Even in one report, he throws pebbles at them. So the Prophet sees him. He says, leave them alone, Omar. <laughs> leave them alone, Omar. And he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Da'hum ya Umar, wa, wa inna andru ilal habasha, wa hum ya... No, 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 that's... Uh, sorry, not that bit. Um, that's uh, Aisha saying, wa ana andru ilal habasha, wa hum ya laguna fil masjid, wa ana jariya. When she says I was uh, jariya. Um, I can't find it now, the time. Let the Prophet said, Let the Yahud see, let the Jews see that in our deen 
We have Fusha. Fi dinina Fusha. Fi dinina Fusha. That we have wideness in our deen. And I've been sent with the deen, which I mentioned earlier on, that is upright and liberal. Samha. Yeah, which is flexible and relaxed. I told you, I'll tell you the context it was in. This is the context he said about him. Yeah. So Omar is being corrected. Yeah. Leave them alone. Let them carry on. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Until Aisha said, I got tired and he kept asking me, have you had enough now? Have you had enough now? And she said, I carried on saying, no, I've not had enough because I wanted to carry on being close to my beloved with my cheek. I wanted to take best as much as I could at that time with him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And her. Um, so some, some, including him, said, hmm, there weren't songs really. There were songs to do with war. And this uh, playing in the masjid, it wasn't playing. They were training for war. Training for war? Why would the Abyssinians come all the way from Abyssinia to come and train for war in the masjid? Because he can't deal with the fact that they're playing and they're dancing. So he said, no, 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 they weren't playing and dancing. They were training for warfare. Well, if they were training for warfare, why was Omar throwing pebbles at them? Because he could have seen they were training for warfare. He'd love it, actually. Omar would join in, wouldn't he? If it was warfare, he was training, they were training for. Why did the Prophet who were training for warfare say, let the Yahud see that we have wideness in our religion? What? Yahud don't train for warfare? <laughs> yeah? Why would he say that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that we have liberality in our religion? Why would Aisha Rana say that imagine a young lady like me who has eagerness to be involved in amusement? Why would she say that? If it's to do with warfare. So this is trying to play games with the evidence in front and now try and dodge it somehow. So let's make it into a war thing. Nothing to do with amusement. This is love. This is amusement. Prophet Oh, here's another one. Prophet came back from a journey when he came back, Jaat Jaria to Soda Fakalat. Jaria, a black woman came, and in one report it mentions it as a woman, interchangeably with Jaria. And that report's authentic. So you understand Jaria can mean woman. Yeah? Who came? She said, Ya Rasulullah, inni kuntu nadartu in Raddakallahu Salihan. I made a vow. That if Allah brought you back safely, that I would play the drum, yeah, and I would sing. The Prophet ﷺ said to her, if you made that as a vow, then go ahead. But if you if you didn't make a vow, then don't go ahead. We know from other hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, there's no fulfilling of vows in maqsiyatillah. If you made a vow for something which is haram, you don't say, I've got to fulfill it, do you? So if this was haram, why didn't the Prophet Sallallahu stop her and say, no, no, you can't fulfill your vow, it's haram. You're, a woman's going to sing for, and everybody's there, everybody's there, not just the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, okay? So, so she started, she started playing the, the, the drum and singing, Abu Bakr came, she carried on playing the drum singing. Uh, 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 Ali came, or Uthman came, carried on uh, uh, singing, Ali came, same thing. Then Omar came. As Omar's coming, she quickly threw the drum underneath and sat on it. ustiha <laughs> <laughs> under a bottom. That's like saying literally saying that in the hadith. She put it under a bottom and sat on it. Fakala Rasulullah in the shaitan ya khafu minka ya Omar. Omar, surely even shaitan is afraid of you, Omar. <laughs> And he explains to, uh, to, to her. So this is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we have here, دَخَلْتُ عَلَىٰ أَبِي مَسُودٍ وَقَرَضَةَ إِبْنِ كَعْبٍ وَثَابِتِ بْنِ يَزِيدٍ 
This is a tabi'i reporting that I came upon and entered upon three of the Sahaba of Rasulullah And the young women were playing the duf and they were singing for those Sahaba. The women were singing for the Sahaba. And I said, you're the Sahaba of the Messenger of Allah and you're allowing this to happen? They said, or one of them said, in one version, they said, if you want to stay, stay. If you don't, off you go, hop it, man. <laughs> We're okay with it. The Messenger of Allah allowed this for us, especially in the case of a, in wedding, and it was a wedding then. And he also allowed us to cry during uh, for the death of someone without lamenting. This also hadith gives you about something about crying. Another one, this is about the Prophet ﷺ. A, a woman came to the Messenger of Allah, and the Messenger of Allah said, Oh Aisha, and Aisha is with him for one moment. Do you know who this woman is? Ata'rifina hadihi. Do you know who this woman is? She said, No. The Prophet said, Hadhi qayna bani fulan. She is a professional singer from such and such a tribe. She's a professional singer. She's known to be a singer. Then he didn't say after that, Haram to her, she'll be going to hellfire. May the Satan's take her and tear her to pieces, etc. Blah blah. What did he say? He says, I said, would you love, would you like that she sings for you? Tuhibina and Tugniyaka and Tugniyaka. All it, naam. I should say, yes. All it, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Faata hu tabakan fa ghannat fa ghannat. So they gave her a plate again to play melody with. This time it's not duff. It's a plate. Anything that you can play some melody with, and she started singing with this. And the Prophet then said, Qad shaitan fi min Surely shaitan is blowing down her nose. So that links with shaitan being mentioned by Abu Bakr, and we'll come to why this is being mentioned here. Yet the Prophet and Aisha are watching. Yeah. So music and singing haram, how can the Prophet actually is asking the singing woman to sing? In another report we have, and I'm running out of time, I just want to uh, mention that what was also famous at the time, and we have um, Here's another one, the Prophet Sallallahu came upon a, a marriage and he sat in a place and the, the young ladies started playing with the drums and singing songs for, for, for the people who had died at, uh, at Badr uh, and then that, those I mentioned to you before already that's about the Abyssinians which I've already mentioned to you uh, this is about another one uh, young ladies in the uh, street who are playing with the drums and singing uh, and the messenger of Allah goes by them and they're singing, we are the, uh, the, 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 the neighbors of Bani Najjar, or we are the girls of Bani Najjar. Ya uh, Habbada Muhammad Min Jar. How wonderful it is to have Muhammad as a neighbor. And so the Prophet said to them, Allahu ya'lam anni la uhibbu kunna. So surely Allah knows how much I love you. Not break this and break that. Also, Men singing. It, the men singers were especially famous for doing huda, which was camel riders. And it was famous in Jahiliya and it carried on. It was encouraged at the time of Rasulullah going to Khaybar, there's authentic hadith. There was a man who was singing. Prophet asked, Who is this Amr? He was famous for singing these songs. And he said the songs made it easier for the journey and made the camels go easily on their journey and go into a rhythm. So that's what they used to do. It's called huda. So the Prophet ﷺ, when they told him it's so and so, because his, uh, his poetry he was singing was beautiful. And the Prophet ﷺ said, may Allah have mercy on him in this authentic hadith. A singer. In one version, there's a singer called Anjasha who was famous. This is authentic hadith. And the Prophet ﷺ had his wives with him and he was leading their camels. And Anjasha singing with a beautiful melodious voice. So now the women are listening to the man singing as well. And the Prophet said, Wayhaka, Rawaidak, Ya Anjasha. He's saying, Whoa, take it easy, slowly, Anjasha, because you, you, you're leading on the camels uh, 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 like, um, like 
glasses. He's describing the wives, the ladies on camelback, like fragile glasses. Because some of them are said it's because they may be mostly affected by the beautiful melody of Hanjasha. So he meant in that metaphoric sense that you might emotionally affect them. But he didn't stop him, even if you track that interpretation. He didn't say, oh, you're going to cause a fitna for the, the, the women on the camel, but you better stop, it's haram. He still carried on singing. He's saying just... Others said it means that the camels were going too fast now and they were, the, 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 on the whole bit, the women were going this way and that way. So he said, just take it easy yeah, with your singing and slow the camel down. So that's all there as well. Uh, those are all authentic hadith and I'm not going to have time to go through all the non-authentic and there's loads of them. There's about 70 odd very weak and fabricated hadith. Those that I've given you are full of times outside Eid even uh, and of men singing in front of women and men, uh, women singing in front of men. True? Both are there. Both of them. Um, and that's important to get the full picture from the time of Rasulullah. All the hadith to do with weak and fabricated are the famous ones you'll hear about the messenger coming to break uh, the, the string instruments and break the, the flutes and break this and break that and pour, lead being poured to the, in the ear of the one who listens to music and singing. All None of them are sound. They are not just weak. They are very weak or fabricated. Yeah? Lots of them, and I've given some examples in the book, as I said, I'm not going to have uh, time to... Uh, 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 somebody who listens to music and singing, two shaitans are sent to dance on their shoulders, and they keep on dancing on their shoulders until he shuts up. Until he stops singing. Again, not authentic. So, and anything to do with string instruments and, and to do with instruments, all these to do with uh, tahbim, haram, and uh, 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 signs of, you know, and, and, and warning of the fire. Some mention the one who sings or listens to uh, singing or music, their salah is not accepted for three days. All this are in this category. Imagine if somebody sang and then for three days they carry on praying, it's not accepted. What nonsense. So, I'll stop there, I've gone well over the time, Farah keeps telling me at the back, to give you a break, and uh, I'll try and conclude, inshallah. Is, is it a conclusion next session, or is it? But there's a session and then conclusion, isn't there? So I'll, I'll try and round up things, how I bring them together and then conclude, inshallah. I couldn't call the other stuff, I don't know what I'm talking about.